Good afternoon. Good morning, Dr. Judson Brandeis. I'm really, really delighted you could join us on this first webcast podcast for Alphagenics. I've been aware of you for quite some time. We've chatted before, of course. We're really pleased to have you here. And the goal of this channel is to talk about men's health, longevity, and well-being. So would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, gosh. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's really an honor all the way from California to be speaking in, in Great Britain. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a history major. I love history. I love British history. So it's even cooler that uh, I, I've, been, you know, I've been all over England. I've been, <clears throat> I know about the Coronation Spoon and William the Conqueror and the Magna Carta. I've been to Salisbury and seen the, old, the oldest Magna Carta ever. So uh, I yes. hope that you guys can understand my California accent. <laughs> <laughs> we can. So, so um, yeah, tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, what yeah. You, so, what, you know, men's health problems are men's health problems, whether you're in California or in England. And so yeah, I trained as a urologist. So, I, you know, I went to medical school. I did a year of research at, at uh, Harvard Medical School. I went to Vanderbilt for medical school. I went to UCLA for to do a surgical residency and then uh, a urology residency. Uh, I've always been a pioneer. I helped pioneer surgical robotics uh, with the Da Vinci surgical robot, which is made kind of down the street from where my office is. Uh, I pioneered MRI guided prostate biopsies, kidney stone centers. And about four years ago, I became really interested in regenerative urology. So the ability to help guys as they get older and they lose the ability to get an erection, how to help these guys get better blood flow to the penis. And I helped uh, do studies on low intensity shockwave therapy, platelet-rich plasma, stem cells, peptides, uh, high intensity focused electromagnetic waves, all these kind of cool new tech things to help guys get better boners and have better physical intimacy. Amazing. And is there like a, is there a protocol that combines a few of those things or is one stand out better than the rest? Yeah, you know, and when guys come to my office, they don't care whether it's one thing or six things that I do for them to get them to that point where they're able to have satisfying uh, intimacy with their partner, right? So I throw the kitchen sink at people. I mean, obviously, there's a stepwise approach. I don't do the same thing for a 50-year-old that I would do for a 75-year-old with diabetes. Um, but I... I, I I, I have a very systematic approach to erectile function, right? So I, I work on boosting the signal. I work on the making sure that the tissue is, is adequate, that gets good oxygenation, that it's well stretched. And then also work on building blood vessels. And then we also work on building the, the, the nerve signals. Uh, and so, you know, some people need a little bit of work and some people need a lot of work. And uh, I have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel and, and on my, um, on my uh, uh, website and I even wrote uh, the most comprehensive and medically accurate men's health book called the 21st century man, which is up there, which is available uh, on hard copy on um, audio book on uh, ebook. And, uh, and it has all, there's a whole huge section in there on sexual medicine on um, how things work, what happens when they don't work, on uh, supplements, on how PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra and Cialis work, how shockwave works, how PRP works, how stem cells work. There's an amazing chapter on stem cells. There's a, a chapter on peptides, on oxytocin, on ipomorphine, on high intensity focused electromagnetic waves, on orgasm. Even though I think one of my favorite chapters in the book is written by Susan Bratton, who's an intimate wellness advisor on how to please a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, all the stuff that you wish you knew when you were 20, it's all in the book. I've got, I actually have your book. So I, I came across you on a podcast like last year. I was, I was sitting on a beach in Mexico and someone said, you've got to listen to this guy. So listen to the podcast, ordered your book. I actually ordered it from America, which cost me a fortune. And then, I found, <laughs> then I found out I could get it on Amazon in the UK. Um, but anyway, so you, you touched on loads of really cool stuff there. But do you find most men come to you when they have a problem 
or are you finding men come to you preventatively saying look i i i, don't, I want this to be perfect forever what, what are you finding and is it changing yeah i mean most guys come to me when um when they're having problems yeah you know, that's just the way guys are right you know you don't fix your car till it's broken till it's you know you're you're on the side of the highway and you either run out of gas or you know the spark plug or the carburetor or something in the car breaks but it's much much better to do preventative maintenance and that's what the book is about that's what my supplements about that's why i go on podcasts all that time because if you look at it in the united states i don't know if it, it's the same or different in in england 100 years ago men lived 1 year shorter than women now men year live five years shorter than women, wow. right? So what happened in those hundred years? And in the United States, longevity is actually on the decline, right? So with modern medicine and, and all the education we have, you would think longevity would keep going up and up and up. But in the United States, it's depression, suicide, alcoholism, and opioids. And people are living less long. This was even before COVID. People are living, men are living less long than they used to. And men are half as likely to go to their primary care doctor as women are, right? So we don't take care of ourselves. We ignore problems. And if there was preventative maintenance, we could have a much, much better life. Scary. So two, two things there, obviously, you beg the question, you know, we are living in the most technologically advanced era we have ever been, but we are getting sicker, it appears. So one, why is that? And then two, which is a totally separate question, why do men struggle to ask for help? So first yeah. one, why, why are we getting sicker? It's surely... It's well, you know, okay, I can, in 10 seconds, I can give you the key to being healthier than 95% of people out there. You interested? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs, don't eat too much, exercise every day, stretch every morning, get good sleep, meditate every day, and be nice to other people. That is a wonderful way to live your life. Yeah, I love that. And I, I do all of them apart from diet is my is my is the thing I haven't quite managed to master yet. I must admit. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that it's easy to say, but those things are, are, you know, we live in a real world. There are a lot of stresses and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of that stuff is hard to do and a lot of it's coping mechanisms, right? So I get stressed in the evening, whatever. Uh, I grab ice cream and yeah. I eat a bowl of ice cream, right? So I know, I mean, be honest, I, there's a lot of sugar in there. There's cream. There's my cholesterol is a little high. I'm on Crestor, right, to knock my cholesterol down. Cause I, you know, I want to keep eating ice cream cause that's sort of my one vice in life. Um, so you're human. So, as well. Yeah. I mean, I listen, <laughs> I, I got more than my fair share of problems, right? I'm far from perfect. Um, and so I understand, you know, I see guys all the time that come in, you know, that drink too much or eat too much or, or smoke or whatever. And I, all I can do is just do the best I can to connect with them and to let them know that there's someone out there that cares, that actually knows a lot of, about this stuff. And I can, I can make recommendations for mm -hmm. them, but I'm not, I tell them, I'm not going to follow you home and make sure that you do it. Yeah. Right. I got my own problems. <laughs> I got to go home and deal with those things. So <laughs> It, it's, it's, it's twofold. It's understanding what you need to do. Some of it's really simple yeah, and some of it's more complicated and then actually executing on that plan. I remember I had a patient that flew all the way from Florida to come see me 3000 miles. And he was asking me about all these peptides, you know, BP 157 and PT 141 and, you know, semaglutide and th this and that, and the other thing. And, uh, and I looked at him, I said, dude, you're 50 pounds overweight. <laughs> So you're eating too much food. Forget about the peptides, you know, get into the gym, work out, don't eat as much, don't yeah. drink alcohol, do the simple stuff before, you know, trying to find these like magic bullet kind of things that are going to make you better. And so, you know, I think really, if you follow the basics, do the basic stuff that we all know that we need to do that sometimes are really hard, you know, like alcohol is bad for you. Let's just 
I mean, I know like everyone in not everyone, but a lot of people in England like go out and drink beer and go to the pubs and so on and so forth. That's great. But understand that you're making a decision. And that decision is to put a substance into your body that one is a depressant, right? The class of medication that alcohol is in, it's a depressant. I mean, you can't deny that. Second of all, most of us do most of the stupid things that we've done in life under the influence of alcohol, right? And everyone I, I say that to, you know, starts shaking their head because we all agree. And if you look at the, the data, the statistic, you know, 50% of traffic fatalities, 80% of domestic abuse. I mean, many, many things that we've done, a lot of the stupid things that we say to other people that are really offensive are done under the influence of alcohol. And then third of all, it's empty calories. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's no nutritional benefit to alcohol. Yeah. Right. You know, that you don't drink a beer to get your vitamins. Um, yeah. So but you, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, just accept that that's you're making a decision to take something into your body that is a depressant that disinhibits you and that's empty calories. And, you know, maybe do it more in moderation. Yeah. So do you think it's the fact that all of this is so convenient now, why we're living less in a shorter duration than we were? Because 100 years ago, it wasn't as easy to get, you know, bad food, empty nutrition, um, alcohol on tap. Well, 100 years ago, it was hard to get food. Yeah. No, I mean, seriously, like 100 years ago, there were no refrigerators. So you had to get fresh food. You know, there the the life was harder. You had to work harder. You couldn't just stand, sit behind a computer and, and, and tap on keys. I mean, that we've discovered that testosterone levels have decreased 30% in industrialized countries versus 50 years ago. Why is that? Well, it's because people just sit behind computers or put a computer on their lap that's why it's called the laptop, right? So they're heating their testicles and testicles are supposed to be outside of your body at 97.1 degrees instead of 98.6 degrees because sperm production takes place better at cooler temperatures, right? And so we're basically inactive. Our body is saying to us, listen, I'm smart. I don't want to make something if I don't need it. And since I'm not trying to kill a mastodon or uh, hunt a saber tooth tiger, I don't need a lot of testosterone. You know, I'm just sitting behind this screen typing away. And so instead of having a testosterone of seven or 800, which you might need to kill a, a mastodon, you get a testosterone of, of three or 400, which is what you need if you're, you know, designing a website or, you know, whatever. I don't want to insult any particular uh, vocation. Um, but I mean, that's just reality. I mean, I, I sit behind my desk most of the day seeing patients and I'm, you know, up and down, but I'm, I'm, I'm not fighting an existential threat where I would need a high level of testosterone. Yeah. 100%. And, and, and for the, for our, what, for our viewers in the UK, 300 is about eight animals per liter and six, 700 is about 17, 16, 17 nanomoles per liter, I think on the scale. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. And I guess the other part of that question, or someone's just pointed out my glasses are glaring, so I'll take those off. These are my blue blockers. We talked about sleep and the quality of sleep is important for men's health. Um, oh, yeah. Sleep is huge. I mean, the thing is, like, I never really appreciated until fairly recently what happens during sleep. So, you know, the sleep is really divided into three phases. The first phase is just getting to sleep. The second phase of sleep is, is rebuilding physical rebuilding the body, right? So when you work out, you don't build muscle. When you work out, you tear muscle down. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't sleep, get good restful sleep, it doesn't matter what you do in the gym, you're not going to build muscle. Yeah. Right. It's well, like, when do they clean the streets? Did they clean the streets during the day? No, they clean the streets at night when no one's on the streets, right? When mm -hmm. do you build muscle? You don't build muscle in the day when you're using muscle, you build muscle at night when you're not using it, that's when you do the repair work. And so yeah. if you're not sleeping well enough, it doesn't matter what you do in the gym, you're not going to build muscle. You also restock testosterone, right? Your, day, at, your testosterone peaks in the morning. It's mm -hmm. lowest at the end of the day. And in between, you know, and then when you go to sleep, you start rebuilding testosterone because you're not using it when you're sleeping. 
right? You also do psychological repair. That's the third phase of sleep. You're also having erections during REM sleep. So if you're not getting into REM sleep, then you're not getting good erections. So I had a, a, a several patients who, you know, have obstructive sleep apnea. They never get into REM sleep. Every time they get into REM sleep, they start choking or suffocating, they wake up, then they go back to sleep and they have erectile dysfunction. They're like early forties, but they have erectile dysfunction because they have obstructive sleep apnea. So sleeping is really important. That's why it's on my list of, you know, the nine important things to do. Yeah. And if someone does have sleep apnea, does it always require like a CPAP mask or is there anything else you can do? You know, um, that's not my expertise, but Dr. Mike Murphy is a Stanford professor and his chapter on sleep in the book is really, really good. It's, it's an incredible function, isn't it? Imagine like our machine just closes down and as you oh, say, yeah. it sets, recalibrates every single night. But for years, we've had this kind of, you know, no sleep mentality. I'll like, sleep when I'm dead. You've got to keep hustling. <laughs> yeah, I remember that Nike commercial. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, out. okay. So the interesting fact that that's actually in the book. Okay, the longest anyone's ever gone without eating is 74 days. The longest anyone's ever gone without sleeping is 11 days. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I did a seven-day fast couple of weeks ago that was pretty tough i was like dreaming about food on day six the 74 days but 11 days no sleep yeah 11 days no sleep you're dead wow well i'm not going to test that one I think yeah so. i don't want to test that one either i'd rather go seven days without food than seven days without sleep i mean uh, when i was doing surgical residency I, I think the longest i ever went was 60 hours um and that was just i, I was just like a I actually went to sleep for 36 hours after that. Wow. Like I lost an entire, I was, I was transitioning from my cardiac surgery rotation to the general surgery rotation. And I was on call the last day of cardiac surgery and the first day of general surgery. And it was, I was a useless human being uh, yeah. by, you know, hour 50. That's a lot. That's a long, long time. Yeah, it was, it was not. They, they changed the way that they train surgeons now in the United States because that's not healthy for yeah, anyone. 100%. For the residents or for the patients. Yeah. And the other part of that question earlier, which I think is a huge part of, of what you are doing and, and us here in the UK is, why don't men talk? What What, what is this about, you know? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a really, that's a really good question. My wife asked me the same question all the time. Uh, you know, I, I think that when we get brought up, we're, we're brought up to be warriors. You know, we're brought up to be brave, to be strong, to basically push off any, any problems. We were brought up to have a kind of hard outer shell mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and any admission of weakness is kind of like a, is a vulnerability. And, uh, and so the idea of going to a doctor who's going to find something wrong with you, uh, it's a vulnerability and nobody, none of us want to feel vulnerable. Um, but at, at the end of the day, you know, we're not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. We all die and yeah. we all end up dying of something. And erectile dysfunction is actually a really, really important early warning sign. So for example, in the 20s, you get great morning wood, right? 30s, maybe you get great morning wood, but 40s or 50s or sometime in your life, you're going to lose erectile function in the morning, right? That means something, right? It means your circulatory system isn't working as well as it should. And 10 years from the time you lose morning erections, it's going to be 10 years till you develop erectile dysfunction, right? When you're engaged in the act and things aren't, don't work out the way that you want them to work out. OK, and if all you do is just borrow your friend's Viagra. You're doing yourself a disservice because the good Lord is sending you a message. Your circulatory system can't support a certain level of circulation anymore. And that's because your blood vessels are getting clogged. Yeah. But if you blow that off and you just take the blue pill for another 10 years, you're going to have some sort of cardiac event, whether it's a, a stroke, a heart attack uh, you know, need for an angioplasty, a visit to the cardiologist, something's going to happen to your heart 
in 10 years. And we've known this for a while, haven't we? This isn't like, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I've had patients that come in that, you know, have heart disease, you know, that I have a lot of cardiologists that send me their patients because they have erectile dysfunction. And we go back in their history. Oh, when did you have your heart attack? Oh, I was 60. When did you develop erectile dysfunction? When did you start using Viagra? Oh, probably when I was about 50. Mm -hmm. huh. So yeah. if, you know, if someone had pulled you aside and said, listen, dude, that's a problem. You know, get a heart calcium scan or get a stress test or get something. And, and that's going to show that you have some underlying heart disease and start exercising, start eating better, start getting better sleep, stop drinking as much, don't smoke, you know, all those things that I talked about that are relatively simple things that everyone knows to do, but they're hard to do on a consistent basis. But if you have the fear of God, because, you know, if you don't do it, you're going to wreck your life with a heart attack or a stroke or something bad. Yeah. yeah, that's the motivation. That's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I had a guy the other day, South Asian guys, Indian guys uh, have smaller blood vessels than white guys. That's just the way it is, right? So the cardiac risk factor for a South Asian or an Indian guy is the same as a white guy with diabetes, right? Wow. So I had a 47-year-old Indian guy come into my office. So I'm close to Silicon Valley. So I got a ton of, of South Asian and Indian patients. And I said to him, I said, you know, you got to start exercising and I put them on an exercise program and a better diet program. And, and we're doing acoustic wave therapy and PRP and, and a firm, which is my nitric oxide booster and a PD5 and all these things. And, uh, and I said, you got to get a heart calcium score, which is a CAT scan that looks at the heart and looks for calcification. And he's like, oh, okay, you know, I'm busy. I'm working for Google or whatever. And, uh, and then he was supposed to come in for an appointment on like week three or week four. And he was doing great. You know, he was turning things around. Uh, and then we got a call and he's in the hospital. I'm like, oh, what happened? He's like, oh, you know, I was riding my bike like you said I was supposed to do. And I started to have chest pain. And I remember what you said. So I called my wife. She picked me up. We drove straight to the hospital. They did, uh, you know, labs. I had elevated troponins which means I'm having a heart attack and I uh, ended up with two stents. Wow. And he's like, you know, I realized you told me to get a heart calcium score. I didn't get it, but at least you told me that I was at risk for a heart disease and I got to the hospital right away. And he didn't, he, you know, he didn't lose any heart muscle. So they were mm -hmm. able to save, you know, the, the vascular function of the heart, which is good. Cause now, you know, he's really, he's doing well, you know, he's just, He's, yeah. he's really focused on on rebuilding. Brilliant. And, and I guess one of the really cool things about what you do is you do get to change people's lives on a, on a daily basis. But what made you get into this area of medicine? You know, I saw that that there were very few people that were were doing it and doing it well. And I saw that there was a desperate need on the part of men to get the kind of information that I can provide. And they were getting it from, you know, nothing against uh, some of the folks that are out there that are quote influencers, um, mm -hmm. but they don't have the same credentials that I have. You know, I have an Ivy League diploma for undergraduate. I went to one of the top medical schools. I've, I've worked with uh, people that won Nobel prizes. Uh, I've, I've done, research sponsored by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Harvard Medical School. I, I finished at UCLA, which is one of the top programs. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of stuff <laughs> and I know how to talk to people because I do it on a daily basis. You know, like when you're, when you're uh, an influencer, you don't have accountability to a patient that's sitting right across from you and saying, you know, well, okay, I heard what you said, but it didn't work. You know, what else? Like if you're out there and saying, well, you know, blueberries are really good for curing cancer. Um, but then someone comes back to you and says, well, I, I ate a lot of blueberries, but, you know, I still have metastatic cancer and it's getting worse. What am I supposed to do? You know, that's a different level of accountability and responsibility. And that's the that's the level that I live on. And so I said, you know, there's got to be someone like me that's out there educating people and writing books doing podcasts, doing research, 
And then I'm like, well, maybe it should be me. Uh, and so I changed the direction of my career. You know, I, I got away from prostate cancer and, and large prostates and kidney stones and incontinence. And, and I, I dove right into to men's health, to hormone replacement, sexual medicine, muscle rebuilding, uh, fat loss, you know, overall male rejuvenation. And it's, you know, it's fun. I love it. It's really, it's incredibly rewarding to have my patients come in and, uh, and see them, uh, see their lives change. Yeah. Seeing them thrive rather than just survive, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I have, I have something for the, what I call the zero to 99% guys. So the people that have kind of regular problems and then for folks that, uh, you know, are really doing all the things that they should be doing. I have a lot of stuff that can take them to the next level, you know, the PRP and the shockwave and uh, M-sculpt, high intensity focused electromagnetic waves, peptides, you know, all these sort of cutting edge stuff that I'm doing also. Yeah, that that stuff sounds really interesting. So yeah. pep peptides aren't, aren't legal yet in the UK. We're not, we're a little bit behind you over there in the US. Um, but you mentioned a few other things there. So shockwave therapy, there are a few clinics popping up with that over here. Um, and then P-Long, I know you, we talked about previously. Do you want to share a bit about that? Oh, yeah. So P-Long was a, a research project that I did because I, as a sexual medicine specialist, I would see a lot of guys that would try to increase the length and girth of their penis and fail miserably and end up with complications. Uh, I know in England, there are some Harley Street guys that are doing uh, fillers, you know, which will give you a... a a thicker penis, you know, a girthier penis, uh, but it doesn't do anything for the head of the penis. So I, we get what's called a pig in a blanket penis. I don't know if you guys have pig in a blanket. In uh, it's like a little hot dog with a big, big bun. Um, yeah. And then you know, fillers are first of all they're expensive, um, and, and second of all they go away. So in a year or two they're gone, and you end up with like a lumpy, bumpy penis. So you know, I've seen a lot of those patients that kind of fail miserably. And uh, there are people do fat transfers, which, you know, are, are really miserable. Uh, there are surgeries that people do, <clears throat> uh, suspensory ligament ligations or, or putting silicone cosmetic implants, which is a total disaster. And so I was like, well, you know, maybe I can figure out something that will increase the length, girth and function of the penis that's not harmful. Mm -hmm. And so I created a, a study called the P-Long study. I got it. Um, IRB approved. So I got the institutional review board to review what I was doing. So I wasn't going to hurt anyone. I got it listed by the NIH. Uh, and then I did the study. I presented it at the International Society of Sexual Medicine meeting uh, for an oral presentation, which is the highest level of presentation. So it's a reviewed meeting, like a bunch of crazy scientists, people like me get together. But most of these guys are at universities. Uh, and we talk about this kind of stuff. And what I found is I have a a, a protocol of using platelet rich plasma. So basically isolating platelets from the, from the blood, reinjecting them into the penis platelets in the body do two things. They cause clot, but they also release growth factors. So this accelerates growth. Then we have a special penile traction device developed by the Mayo clinic uh, and extensively tested that will increase length. We have a penis pump that will increase girth. And then the Affirm nitric oxide circulation boosting supplement that I developed that brings blood flow to the penis, helps stretch the penis. And after six months, the average patient in my study increased the length of their penis two centimeters and increased the girth of the penis one centimeter with absolutely no complications. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I was, I was, and I was yeah, I smiled to myself if you're talking there because when I started on this men's health journey as well, I was chatting to someone here in the UK and they said, you know, in 10 years time, um, most men over 40 will have penis pumps. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of as it's taboo kind of in some areas. You know, it's just like going to the gym. You know, it, it's a way just to improve the blood flow to the area. And he gave me a link to this particular product. 
thought that's really expensive. Like, I don't even know if this is going to work. So I got one that was like much, much cheaper on Amazon and it nearly pulled the thing off. I was, <laughs> I was like, stuck it straight in the bin. I was like, that is not going to work. Um, so if you're going to do it, if someone's watching and you're going to do it, do it properly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're going to put something on your penis, make sure that it's, uh, <laughs> you know what? They're like, you can cut corners. Like, you know, I don't want to buy Heinz ketchup. I'll buy like uh, lower level ketchup or something like that. But if you're going to put something on your penis, <laughs> I don't think that's where you want to like uh, uh, save money. <laughs> like, yeah. if, you know, if you're if you're spending money on a car, right, like you might want to save a little money on the stereo system, but don't save money on the brakes. A hundred percent. Yeah. From experience, do not. Buy the rubbish yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you can hurt yourself. Definitely. <laughs> Um, so, you know, uh, we're, we're developing a network of P-Long providers all throughout the United States. So already within like a month and a half, I have 50 providers in the United States. I developed an ultrasound guided technology for injecting a PRP, uh, which is really cool. And, uh, and we have uh, providers now in Canada, uh, in Bahrain, uh, New Zealand. Uh, and so we're, we're definitely training and looking for more providers in uh, in great britain fantastic in the Isles. we shall chat chat more about that what about um what about shockwave would you combine the p-long with shockwave afterwards as well yeah you know that's a great question so when you do a study you don't want too many variables mm -hmm. and so uh we intentionally left off shockwave therapy because really it's not increasing the length that the focus of shockwave is to trick the body into thinking that there's an injury and creating an injury response, which then grows blood vessels. So an injury response doesn't grow size. Mm -hmm. It grows blood vessels. Now, blood vessels are important, but we're doing this in guys with already normal erections and normal circulatory function, right? We, don't, we didn't do this study on guys who are 65, 70 years old who have erectile dysfunction because all those guys, their penises are getting shorter, but that's because they can't get enough blood pressure to fill the penis they have. Ah, okay. So what's the point of giving them a bigger penis? Then they won't be able to fill the penis, you know, yeah, even more. So, so this, you know, P-Long is really for guys 20 to 50 who have normal erectile function that want a bigger penis. If you're over 50 and you develop erectile dysfunction, then shockwave therapy is great. PRP is great. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that's really great that, you know, is all over my YouTube and Instagram and, and website and my book. Um, and, you know, that's what my supplements are for. Um, but P-Long really is for normal, healthy guys who want bigger penises, right? And I'm telling, I'm not telling you to get a bigger penis. I don't want to make you insecure, right? That's your choice. I'm saying, if you want a bigger penis, don't go to Harley Street and get filler because it's going to be expensive and it's going to go away in a year or two. Don't don't get fat transfers. Don't get surgeries. You know, go get P-Long. It gives you a bigger, symmetrical, better functioning penis. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. What about, um, you mentioned fillers. What about Botox? Because some people are getting Botox. As well, yeah, so I actually started to do that um, about a month ago. So there was, there's based on one study. And that study is out of Egypt. Uh, and uh, I think the guy's name is Hussein. Uh, and it's just being the sub, the study is actually just being published now in, uh, in, in the urology gold journal. Um, but they, they, they looked at uh, Botox injections, 50 units and a hundred units. So that's actually a pretty high dose, right? When I get Botox for my forehead, it's usually 50 units. Um, but the lethal dose of Botox, right? So Botox can kill you with a high dose is a hundred bottles of Botox, right? So we're just using either a half a bottle or a full bottle. And, it, you know, Botox injection in the penis doesn't really make sense, right? Why would it give you an erection? But if you think about it, when you're in the flaccid state, the smooth muscle in the penis is contracted. And because it's contracted, it keeps the blood from flowing into the penis, right? Because, you know, the, the good Lord or mother nature didn't intend us to use the penis all the time. The, the mother nature intended to use, use the penis only for the purposes of procreation, mm -hmm. right? So you don't want blood flowing in there unless you really need it. 
Now, when you get an erection, right? So you get stimulation from the brain that goes down through the nerves and it re releases neurotransmitters. And what that does is it relaxes the smooth muscle, the vascular smooth muscle, and allows blood to flow into the penis more easily. And so it allows you to get an erection better. And so what Botox in the penis is doing is it's relaxing the vascular smooth muscle. So my gay patients love it because they can walk around the gym or the locker room or wherever they're walking, you know, their gay cruises, uh, and they have much bigger size in the flaccid state. Because okay. And then, yeah, because the vascular smooth muscle isn't blocking blood from coming into the penis. And then what my other patients who are older are saying is one that um, they get erections quicker, right? Because there's not that blockage of blood and they get better erections, right? So it's not miraculous. It's yeah. not going to take a 75 year old diabetic uh, and turn them into a, a porn star. Hang on one second. Come on. What's up? Oh, um, Cassie's here for procedure. Okay. Just give me five or 10 minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, we're, we're firing live ammo out on the clinic. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but so my 70, 75 year old guys, you know, they're not turning into porn stars, but it's just another technology that we can use to move the needle to help guys get uh, better function. Yeah. You know, along with Affirm along with PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra and Cialis, along with Shockwave, along with PRP, along with penis pumps, along with peptides, along with HIFEM. You know, it's just, you know, when you do what I do, you have to have a lot of different arrows in your quiver. Yeah. And do, uh, do you think us guys should be taking like a, a, a regular annual course of like low dose Tadalafil, something like that? Just to I improve? put a lot of patients on that. It's a Tadalafil is a great drug. Yeah, it really is. It's totally safe. Um, you know, there are very few side effects. You know, some people get some facial flushing or a little bit of reflux, but at that dose, very rare. And also it improves urination. Uh, and because it's generic, it's really inexpensive. Uh, so I put a ton of my patients on that. Yeah, I, 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 I've been, I did a course of that last year and again now, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I know you've got obviously five minutes or so get off there so just a couple of quick questions to finish one which i've got to ask does pilon our botox hurt because i thought of sticking a needle in there to be yeah so you know it's a great question and i can i i don't like saying every but i will say every patient who i do it on afterwards they look at me and say that wasn't nearly as bad as i thought it was going to be mm -hmm. So what I do is I use a 30 gauge needle, which is a tiny, tiny needle. And then doing this on myself, you kind of learn a lot uh, because you get sort of immediate feedback. Um, if you introduce the needle really slowly, um, you don't shock the nerves and feel that kind of wince or pain. Mm -hmm. um, the nerves kind of begin to equilibrate and... Um, and so it, honestly, it, it's really not bad. And once a needle's in the penis, in the erectile body, it doesn't matter. You know, when you're injecting, you don't feel it because that's a big vascular space and you're just injecting platelets and, and serum back into that vascular space. Um, and and so really, it, it's, not, it's not painful. I would say it's, uh, most people would characterize it as mildly uncomfortable. Wow. Okay. And you have, do you have two or three injections at one go? Two. Yeah. Two. One on either side even though the, the two sides are connected, but yeah. they're, they're not fully connected. So we just do one on either side. It takes me three minutes. Wow. Okay. And then one final thing you've mentioned a few times, um, your supplement range. Um, I'm really pleased that we're going to be bringing that over to the UK, but would you like to say anything about that? And there are four supplements, aren't there? Yeah. So, you know, okay, here we go. We have the first supplement is a firm. Affirm is a nitric oxide booster. So when I was at UCLA, I was uh, taught by Dr. Louis Ignaro, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the mechanism of action of nitric oxide, right? Nitric oxide works by getting released from nerves and making this stuff called cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP is what opens up blood vessels. And it does it all throughout the body. 
right? Men, women, cats, dogs, rhinoceroses, any mammal uses nitric oxide to open up blood vessels. So elite endurance athletes use this, bodybuilders use this. It improves cognition, you know, short-term memory in men over the age of 65 or really anyone. But, you know, as you age, you make, make less and less nitric oxide. It also improves blood flow to the penis. It also decreases blood pressure. I get a ton of patients off their blood pressure medications by using this. And then, you know, another one of my professors met Dr. Ignaro in a freight elevator. And that collaboration resulted in the paper that described the mechanism of action of Viagra. Uh, and a nitric oxide booster like a firm makes... Viagra work better because they work synergistically. And the beautiful thing is there's no side effects whatsoever of taking nitric oxide booster. I made a video where I took eight Affirm pills, eight nitric oxide boosting pills. I had no side effects whatsoever except a great erection in the morning. Wow. Okay. So, and it's L-citrulline. Yeah. So the, the nitric oxide donor is actually all arginine, but L-arginine doesn't get absorbed well by the GI tract. So you have to take L-citrulline and then the kidney turns L-citrulline into L-arginine. And then L-arginine grabs a oxygen molecule, breaks it in half, makes nitric oxide and gets recycled back to citrulline. And then the other thing is this contains beets. Beets have nitrates. Nitrates get reduced to nitrites in the saliva. Nitrites get reduced to nitric oxide in the stomach by stomach acid, right? So that's why taking um, uh, uh, mouthwashes are not so great for blood pressure and for nitric oxide and taking antiacids for the stomach aren't great for, for nitric oxide. So that's, wow. uh, that's our flagship product. Now, the, another product that I created is called Support. Now, I know you folks in, in uh, England aren't too keen on uh, DHEA, which is a testosterone precursor. And so we're gonna try to find a way around that, but also it contains DIM which blocks the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. It also contains Tonkat Ali. Tonkat Ali blocks uh, the binding site on a sex hormone binding globulin so that you end up with a higher percentage of free testosterone. Um, and then Prelong is a supplement for premature ejaculation, right? And so um, it's basically based on a isolate and derivative of St. John's wort. So what we know is that selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro um, reduce premature ejaculation, right? But a lot of people don't want to be on pharmaceutical grade antidepressants. And so, you know, a lot of folks in the continent, like where you are, use St. John's wort. Yeah. Um, but St. John's wort is something that has high perforin and high paracin. Right. And so those are the two isolates in St. John's wort. And so this isolates hyperferin, which has more efficacy and less side effects and can improve premature ejaculation, which, you know, is a complex problem uh, because there's no scientific model to study premature ejaculation, right? So like, you know, we don't have rats that have premature ejaculation that we can do studies on. In nature, premature ejaculation is really good means you do your business quickly and you can turn around and defend yourself, right? Yeah. So we're basically fighting against mother nature. And so there are delay sprays, there are lubricants, there are uh, pills and, and all those things in combination with some behavioral modifications can help guys with premature ejaculation. Yeah, and what, then, is, what is premature as well? So is there a type? Or an yeah. I mean, the thing is it, it, it's really beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So, but there's two really classes of premature ejaculation. One, if a guy ejaculates within a minute on a very consistent lifelong basis. And that typically it relates to some serotonin issues up in the brain. And those guys respond well to selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or something like prelong. Another thing is penile sensitivity. So if, if a guy has a penis that's hypersensitive, right, then a delay spray or a, a silicone-based lubricant um, are going to be a more effective uh, treatment for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, And then some people have a combination of the two.
And I think I read in, in your book, the av average length, the average duration is seven minutes. Uh, anywhere from three to seven minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like all these pornos that people watch or movies where guys go on for hours and hours and hours having sex, you know, that's just not reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's like, please don't base your idea of yourself or your own performance on, you know, some unrealistic expectation. But do you think that's more a problem now? Because pornography is so prevalent and so easily accessible. With yeah. The I mean, porno pornography is a whole, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book on pornography and how it destroys people's expectations and how a lot of guys get erectile dysfunction based just on pornography, right? So, you know, like in the beginning, it totally desensitizes you. So in the beginning, you watch pornography, there's like one guy, one girl, then that's not good enough. So it's got to be one guy and two girls. Then that's not good enough. So it's got to be six guys and 10 girls. Then that's not good enough. It's got to be, you know, a guy and a, and a, a girl and a donkey, and then a guy and a girl and a chicken. I mean, you know, like, where does it end? Yeah. Uh, and so then when you, you know, you're out in a, in a pub and you pick up a, a girl and you bring her home and, you know, she doesn't look like Pam Anderson uh, and there's only one of her. You're like, well, you know, where's the rest of the party? And so it, it, it it's just really not um, beneficial. I think. Healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the, the final supplement before I have to go and stick needles in guys penises is uh, spunk. Right. So spunk is my prostate supplement that's based on beta cytosterol, which, you know, testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone at the prostate. And DHT has a tighter binding affinity to the testosterone receptor, which is what makes your prostate grow. And so, you know, a lot of these um, will help reduce your conversion to dihydrotestosterone. It also has pigeum, it has flax, it has pumpkin seed extract. Uh, some zinc and some magnesium. And so these are all uh, data proven supplements, botanicals that will improve uh, prostate function and urination. Fantastic. And, and there's, some re there's some recent research, isn't there, around the fact that it's low testosterone that drives um, prostate enlargement rather than the opposite where we used to think it was well it, you know it's it's low testosterone you know that's a great that's a great point and that's a whole other uh, sort of lecture our our understanding of how testosterone interacts with the prostate is very is, is undergoing a radical change but really it's the dht yeah. that affects the the um the prostate and uh, so there's a medication, finasteride or proscar or dutasteride, which is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which blocks the conversion of testosterone to um, DHT. But there are some big problems with those medications. They'll drop your libido significantly. They even get uh, uh, post-finasteride sy syndrome. So some guys get permanent erectile dysfunction from that. And I've actually seen some of those guys in my office. So... Um, you know, spunk is a good place to go when you have mild urinary symptoms. Beyond mild urinary symptoms, go to a urologist and there are a whole host of medications and procedures that we can do to help you fix those issues. Fantastic. Well, Judson, it has been an absolute honor to have you on our first, first webcast. Thank you very much for joining us. You've got patients to go and inject, but uh, I shall speak to you very soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.